fats, now we're going to be building up amino acids, nucleotides, and everything that comes from their related backgrounds. So this very first part, we're going to look at nitrogen. Okay, so we've talked about nitrogen breakdown. Now we're going to be talking about how nitrogen is used for biosynthesis. Okay. Which we only do a slightly better job in organic chemistry and discussing nitrogen than we do sulfur. <laughs> you know, organic chemistry, we focus so much on carbon and oxygen, and those are very important, obviously. We do focus a little bit on nitrogen, but nitrogen and sulfur are used a lot in, in vivo. So that's one of the nice things about biochemistry is you get to see some of the other things in action. So with the exception of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, it, it's what, so it's the fourth, the fourth largest, um, fourth, most populated, I don't know what the word, right word would be in English, uh, most used uh, element in, in living systems. Okay. We talk about how to get rid of it. Remember, fish can just, most fish can just pee it out, urinate it out in the form of ammonia. Of course, then we do it in the form of urea because we get all of our possible electronic energy from it as, as we can. And then there are short, like reptiles and certain birds that also do urecatelic acid. Ure and so they're uric acid, I should say, they're uricatelic animals. But now, from where does it originate? And, oh, uh, just a little side note here that why are amino acids nucleotide biosynthesis linked together? And that's because certain amino acids, or parts of them, because we're going to see that we're going to take bits and pieces from here and there, are used to make nucleotides. Of course, then to make DNA, that you cover that in genetics, and, and we don't take the time here to talk about DNA polymerase and how it comes together and all that kind of stuff to make it. But we'll we'll look look a little bit about nucleotides themselves. <clears throat> okay, most of the chemistry is related, and so we talk about the transfer of nitrogen, and we have one carbon transfers. So there's some. And there are, of course, lots and lots and lots of diseases associated with amino acid biosynthesis, nucleotide biosynthesis. There are redundancies around, um, but we do, I mean, there are lots of problems. This is something from GenBio. So I, I am not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's the nitrogen cycle. But much like carbon, and I don't know how much this is covered in general, general biology, but much like carbon can be oxidized and reduced, so can nitrogen. So I've already mentioned how we try to get all of our electronic energy we can out of nitrogen, but this is also showing that. And so this is the oxidation state of nitrogen. Of course, elemental nitrogen has an oxidation state of zero. If it's fully reduced, it's gonna be ammonia. If it's fully oxidized, it's gonna be nitrate. Okay, nitrite is the in-between. And so there are different ways around all of this and so this is a nitrogen cycle 80 ooh, got big again 80 percent of the air is actually nitrogen not oxygen i have been amazed sometimes when i ever, ever, ever asked you what's the number one component of air and how many people say that's oxygen well it's not really it's, it's nitrogen okay. and so we're going to start on the left say that plants actually take the ammonia and they can, with nitrogen fixation, what they can do is they can incorporate it into amino acids. So that's one way that we can get into our diet ourselves. So we can use that which comes from plants. Then, as a little other side note, there are denitrifying bacteria. <laughs> And fungi and things, and what happens is instead of oxygen, they use, actually use nitrate okay, to make ATP. Now, how we use uh, ours, oxphos pathway was tied to oxygen. Their oxphos pathway would be tied to um, nitrate instead. Okay. So because of that, they can help um, you know replenish the nitrogen in the air. And then, of course, I, I put this every year. At some point in time, it's no longer going to be recent. <laughs> Recently, meaning 
late 90s, early 2000s, maybe. I'm not a historian. There's a whole host of bacteria that's been discovered, and they think that it's actually what puts the majority of nitrogen in the air. In the past, they thought, oh, it's due to nitrogen fixation with the bacteria, other bacteria, and archaea and the fungi. But now there are these one, there are these others, and they're called Animox, which I think is like an awesome, awesome name. And so we'll talk about it because it's really interesting what they do. And of course, this is just something to fathom from creation, in the sense that it's one way that it's, you know it's very synergistic. Okay. But before I do that, I just wanted to point on the fact that, you know, ammonia can be oxidized to make nitrate, then nitrifying bacteria can make, I mean, nitrite, and then it can be on main nitrate, and then once again, we just repeat this cycle over and over again, and we can utilize the ammonia to make other reduced nitrogen and carbon-containing compounds. But this is for Animox. What does it kind of look like? If you just look at it, what does it kind of look like? Like ATP synthase, you know, what, like, like what we have for mitochondria. And, and it is very similar to this. It uses a special compart compartment called the, I always have problems saying this word, anamoxosome. Just like we have mitochondria, the anamox bacteria have an anamoxosome. And so what they do is they, whoops, they have their cytosol and then they have their, I don't actually know what the inside's called. I'm gonna call it the matrix, but that, probably is not the right word, because I'm not a you know, my, microbiologist, but they actually utilize hydrazine, which hydrazine is rocket fuel. So it is an explosive situation for them. But they take the ammonia, they have a hydrolase that makes it into hydrazine, which is rocket fuel, and at the same time, then they have this hydrazine oxidizing enzyme for their formation of um, the if, if their, their version of oxfos that will reconvert it back to nitrogen okay but i wanted to point out here is if we can see see it's taking protons from one side of course this is the shuttling of electrons using the different oxidation states of nitrogen and then it uses an atp synthase similar to our own which the protons will travel through this is where protons come back protons travel through and we get the atp synthase they make ATP. But I just always like the fact to always point out that, that, that they use rocket fuel. And um, they are anaerobic, so it's, usually it's found in sewage. Okay. They don't need oxygen. They use nitrogen. Okay. All right. And the nitrogen fixation cycle, once again, converts elemental nitrogen to ammonia. It's very, very exergonic if you think back to Gen Chem. And one of the problems is the fact that nitrogen is so stable. And that's one of the reasons, just as a side note, whenever you're working with things that are, that we react with oxygen, like some of the elements and things like that in chemistry, they actually have you pipe in nitrogen gas on top of it because nitrogen's inert. Or they'll put in argon or something like that. <clears throat> Okay. But certain bacteria in archaea, they can actually hydrolyze ATP in something called nitrogenase complex. I was going to get through the next three slides to show you the nitrogenase complex. Because this is ultimately how they're going to take nitrogen to make it ammonia, which can then be used for other things. Okay. Since nitrogen, elemental nitrogen itself is so inert. So it's called a nitrogenase complex is the enzyme. That's the enzyme name. I would, you know, I won't say what class of enzymes is this. It's the nitrogenase complex. This is what it looks like. Okay, so based off of its species, they can actually vary in what they use here, but at least one, if not more, utilize pyruvate to make acetyl-CoA, something similar to what we see with our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Of course, these give off electrons, and what happens here is that these electrons then are passed off through these ferredoxin or flavodoxin. And so we've seen this, this would be similar to like our FMN and FMNH2. 
<clears throat> so then it goes from the oxidized to the reduced form. Ooh. Sorry, it's going to get big every single time. I wish it wouldn't. There you go. And they just keep passing this, these electro, whoa, I'm sorry. <laughs> they keep passing these electrons. Then it goes from reduced back to oxidized. And what it does is it takes this dinitrogenase reductase enzyme, and it goes from oxidized to reduced, because it now has all of the electrons. And I'm not so worried that you know the numbers 4 and 8 and 16. That's not the important part here. The important part here is the fact that you start off with a pyruvate, passes it off the electrons to the flavidoxins, which passes it off to this dinitrogenase reductase. Dinitrogenase reductase does require ATP in order for it to pass off the electrons. So whenever it loses electrons, if you think back to Leo the Lion goes grr, what does that mean? If it's losing electrons, it is... Oxidation, right? So, and it's being oxidized. So, what enzyme do you suppose is being reduced by dinitrogenase reductase? This is sort of like the you know, Jeopardy sometimes has those dumb answers or stupid answers category. What enzyme do you suppose dinitrogenase reductase is reducing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so that's why. Um, I just point out the fact because sometimes people get it backwards. The dinitrogenase reductase is being oxidized, but it's reducing dinitrogenase. And then the dinitrogenase, once it's reduced, can pass the electrons off from elemental nitrogen to make ammonia. It does require protons, obviously. But we started off, so this is one way of shuttling the electrons from pyruvate all the way down to make ammonia. Okay. And so if need be, you can always work backwards and start off here and say, okay, this is dinitrogenase. It got reduced by dinitrogenase reductase, and then these are flavidoxins. I got it from pyruvate or something similar to that that could be settled. Okay. Um, just a little side note is dinitrogenase itself is a tetramer. They call it a two plus two, which if you remember from last semester, what that means is that there's a total of four subunits, but two of them are identical, and then there are two other ones. We kind of saw that with like, uh, with, I was trying to remember some of the proteins that we looked at last semester, but it's slipped in my mind. But what's really, I think is kind of cool and different is that this uses MO, which what MO stands for? What is MO? It's molybdenum. This is a molybdenate. It, 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 it contains molybdenum, which is important. So when we pick up on the next class, we'll actually...